you experiencing any trouble in your life? Have uh, you had the wind knocked out of you, so to speak? Maybe you find your head where your feet were just a few minutes before. Some unexpected things have come into your life. Well, friend, there's a God in heaven who knows your name. You're not a faceless person in the crowd to him. You're not some number on an endless list. He knows you intimately and he wants to help you. Why don't you listen over the next few minutes, whatever you're doing, set it aside, and let's give the Word of God first priority in our lives. And I trust that God, by His Spirit, will speak to you through His Word today. I believe you're going to get what you need. Here in 2 Corinthians 4, Paul, among other things, talks about some of the difficulties that he experienced as a minister of the gospel. And I love his candor and his transparency as he talks about stuff he's going through, what he is feeling. You know, he just sort of lays it all out there. And look with me at a couple verses, beginning in verse 8. We are hard-pressed on every side, yet not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroy. I said we're hard pressed on every side. Literally, trouble is pressing into us from all sides. You ever feel that way that every direction you look there's trouble? You know, every time you sort of get your head above the water, here comes another set of waves, you know, to pummel you. No matter what horizon you choose to scan, some trouble is looming up on that horizon. You can feel a bit like Jonah when he got swallowed by the whale. Everywhere he looked, there was whale. He looked up, there was whale. He looked down, there was whale. He looked back, there was whale. He looked forward, there was whale. Whale, 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 whale. And some people feel that way with their troubles. And Paul said, hey, we are being pressed from every side by troubles. But then he said, we're not crushed. And that word crushed literally means we are not hemmed in. We're not boxed in. We're not left without a way out. We are not cornered. So the problems are coming in from every angle, but God always makes a way of escape. You might be thinking, all right, I don't see it. Well, neither did he. Look at the next thing he said. He said, we are perplexed, but we're not in despair. Perplexed means we don't understand what to do next. The Jerusalem Bible said, we see no answer to our problems but we never give up. You may not know exactly what to do right now. You may not understand what course of action would be best for you to take, but friend, don't despair. God is going to help you. Kenneth Wiest, in his translation from the original Greek, puts the verse this way. We are bewildered, not knowing which way to turn, but not utterly destitute of poss possible measures or resources. You may not know which way to turn right now, but I'm telling you there are measures you can take and there are resources that you can pull from. He went on and said, we're persecuted, but we're not forsaken. That is not forsaken by God. He never forsakes you and he never leaves you. And then he said, struck down, but not destroyed. And I love Philip's translation. Listen to it. We may be knocked down, but we're never knocked out. Don't you love it? The Living Bible puts it this way. We get knocked down, but we get up again, and we keep going. And I want to talk to you about getting up when you've been knocked down and getting going again. You see, the fight's not over if you've been knocked down. It's only over if you quit, and you don't have to quit. Uh, maybe the devil has knocked you down. Maybe you've taken a knockdown concerning your finances lately. You're laying on the mat, gasping, and you don't know what you're going to do. You're a bit perplexed. Maybe it's with your kids. Maybe with your marriage. Maybe with your health. Maybe some other arena of life. Maybe you received some news recently that just sort of knocked the wind out of you. You didn't see it coming. Or on the other hand, maybe you knew it was coming, and you were dreading its arrival and it came, and you feel like you've been knocked down. Well, you know, Paul said that he faced trouble on every side. There were times when he didn't know what to do, 
And he said, there were times that we have been struck down. We have been knocked to the ground. He said, but we're not destroyed. God's not through with you, my friend. The last chapter of your story has not been written yet. The fact that you're here today is a testament to the fact that the devil hasn't been able to destroy you. You are here. You're in God's house. You're breathing. You're still going. And I believe that even as you listen, the Holy Spirit can infuse strength into your inner person, lift you up on the inside, help you get up if you've been knocked down, get going, and get through whatever you might be facing. And I just want to briefly share with you a small handful of things that commonly cause people to quit or become excuses for people to quit. The first one is sin. People yield to a temptation, they sin, and the thought comes to a man, you've done the same stupid thing again, you may as well just give it up. You're not getting anything out of going to church, serving God, you ought to just quit. And some people don't even need a devil to condemn them. They do a fine job themselves of condemning themselves. In fact, their own self-condemnation is much more of a reality to them than the forgiveness of God. I want you to look with me at two contrasting stories, and they're actually set back to back in the Scripture, which is interesting that they are. Two people that sinned against the Lord, and two completely different ways that they responded, two completely different outcomes. And I want you to look with me at Matthew 26, if you would, as we look at the first of these two stories. Matthew's Gospel, the 26th chapter. And where this opens up, Peter has just been talking to the Lord very boldly as Jesus has told them that they're all going to forsake him. He knew the scripture and quoted the scripture, strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. And Peter says, Lord, no, if everyone else forsakes you, I will not leave you. And then he went a step farther. He says, I'm ready to die for you. If it costs me my life, I'll never abandon you, Jesus. Jesus said, Peter, before the rooster crows, you're going to deny that you even know me three times. And I'm sure Peter inside felt a bit insulted by that, thinking, never. Jesus, I'd lay my life down for you now. And of course, Jesus was arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane. And the prophecy was fulfilled. Everyone scattered, Peter included. Jesus is taken to the high priest's place, and Peter follows at a distance. And we pick it up in Matthew 26, verse 69. It says, Now Peter sat outside in the courtyard, and a servant girl came to him, saying, You also are with Jesus of Galilee. But he denied it before them all, saying, I do not know what you're saying. And when he had gone out to the gateway, another girl saw him and said to those who were there, this fellow also was with Jesus of Nazareth. And again, he denied with an oath, I do not know the man. And a little later, those who stood by came up and said to Peter, surely you also are one of them, for your speech betrays you. Then he began to curse and swear, saying, I do not know the man. Immediately the rooster crowed. And Peter remembered the word of Jesus who had said to him, before the rooster crows, you'll deny me three times. So he went out and wept bitterly. Bitter, stinging tears of remorse. Imagine the guilt and the shame that he felt. He's just told Jesus, I'll never forsake you. I'll die for you. And now... He is cursing and swearing and making oaths publicly. I don't even know who he is. I've never heard of him. And he was so sorry, and he wept, and he wept. But you know, Peter did receive the forgiveness of God. After the resurrection, Jesus sent the message via the women, go tell the disciples and Peter, singled Peter out, that I'm going before them into Galilee. And who is it that there rises up on the day of Pentecost as the fiery preacher leading thousands to Christ? It's Peter. 
Who is it that becomes a pillar in the church? It's Peter. He received forgiveness of God even though he publicly denied Jesus. He was washed clean by the blood of Christ and walked in that forgiveness and went on and did amazing things for God. But directly following this story, we have a story of someone else that sinned against the Lord. Chapter 27, verse 1. When morning came, all the chief priests and elders of the people plotted against Jesus to put him to death. And when they had bound him, they led him away and delivered him to Pontius Pilate, the governor. Then Judas, his betrayer, seeing that he had been condemned, was remorseful and brought back the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders, saying, I've sinned by betraying innocent blood. And they said, what's that to us? You see to it. Then he threw down the pieces of silver in the temple and departed and went out and hanged himself. Judas experienced the same feelings of remorse that Peter did. The scripture said he was remorseful. He was sorry for what he had done. He admitted, admitted to the priest, I've sinned. He's innocent. And it says he did that when he saw he was condemned. Maybe Judas didn't actually expect that it would go that far. Maybe he thought that like before when the angry crowds tried to, 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 you know, get Jesus, he just was able to pass through their midst and escape. Perhaps he thought that would happen again. But now he sees that they're going to kill him, and he's filled with remorse. But instead of going to God for forgiveness, he goes to the priest and tries to buy it by giving back the silver. And friend, you cannot buy the forgiveness of God. It is a grace that must be received by faith alone. No good works, no payment will ever pay for it. And Judas, though I believe forgiveness was available to him, went out self-condemned. In a big way, he quit. Went out and hanged himself. Now, think about it. Both Peter and Judas were knocked down by sin. Peter denied Jesus publicly. Judas betrayed him privately. Peter got up. Judas didn't get up. And to a degree, some Christians act more like Judas than Peter when they sin. They're remorseful, they're sorry, and they try through their good works to somehow, you know, get into God's good graces. Well, you know, I, 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 if I just do good, you know, and don't mess up for a certain period of time, then I, I can come before God. Or if I read so many chapters every day for this many days, or, you know, if, 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 I, if I have perfect church attendance. Friend, your perfect church attendance is good, your Bible reading is good, but it will never merit you forgiveness. It is by grace. God is rich in mercy to all those who call upon him, not those who earn it. By grace, through faith, not of works, lest any man should boast, the book of Romans says. And if you've been knocked down by sin, well, get up again. The blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin, and I want to tell you, God is not mad at you. He loves you. Don't let it keep you down. Second thing that keeps a lot of people down is when they experience tragedy, experience a loss. Maybe in regards to a loved one or a family member. And many times, unfortunately, the blame for life's tragedies gets laid at God's feet. And it tends to separate people from God. So look in the book of Ruth with me if you have your Bible. If you're just new to navigating your Bible, you can start in Genesis. Go forward, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, and Ruth. Ruth was a Moabitess. She was raised in a pagan culture. She was raised to worship idols. And an Israelite named Elimelech and his wife Naomi moved to the land of Moab with their two boys. The two boys took Moabitess wives. One married a girl named Orpah, the other married Ruth. And Elimelech died. Naomi became a widow. Orpah's husband died. She became a widow. Ruth's husband died. She became a widow. So now we have these three widows living there together. And the Bible paints the picture of them being in a place of abject poverty. They had nothing. And 
Naomi hears that God has visited the Israelites, the famine in the land has ended, the crops are growing again, and she says, I'm going to go back. You girls, you need to go find yourself some husbands. And we pick it up in verse 12 of Ruth chapter 1. Here's Naomi speaking to the girls, Turn back, my daughters, go, for I'm too old to have a husband. If I should say I have hope, if I should have a husband tonight and should also bear sons, would you wait for them till they were grown? Would you restrain yourselves from having husbands? No, my daughters, for it grieves me very much for your sakes that the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. Then they lifted up their voices and wept again, and Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. And she said, Look, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. But Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave you, or to turn back from following after you. For wherever you go, I will go. Wherever you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, and your God my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. The Lord do so to me, and more also, if anything but death parts you and me. Ruth had every reason in the world to not want to go back with Naomi to the land of Israel to not serve Naomi's God, but she had seen something during the short time that she was a part of this family, a reality in this Jehovah God that they serve that she never found in Chemosh or the other gods of the Moabites. And she may have thought, I don't understand why my husband died. I don't know why I lost my brother-in-law or my father-in-law, but I know there's a reality here, and I am not going to let these tragedies separate me. I'm going to go where you go. Your God is going to be my God. Your people are going to be my people. And the only thing that will keep me from obeying that is death. And I just, I love it. There's never, you read through the book, there's not the slightest shadow of bitterness against God. And Ruth's life, even though her mother-in-law got a bitter spirit, and Naomi wrongly blamed God for everything that happened. She even got back to the land of Israel, all of her old friends, and Naomi, she says, I've changed my name, call me bitter. My name is Mara now, for the Almighty has dealt bitterly with me. And Ruth never picked up that bitter spirit from her mother-in-law. And I know there are people in here that have had some t terrible tragedies happen maybe lost a child or a loved one or some other thing and no explanation for it. Well, you know, we are living in a fallen world and everything does not work the way it was originally created to work. One day God's going to make a new heavens and a new earth and everything will be back to perfection then. Don't lay all of the, the tragedies and the things that happen at God's feet. God is a good God. Jesus said, I came that you might have life and have it more abundantly. He said, the thief comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. And I just want to tell you, if you're one of those that has experienced the tragedy, maybe you don't have an answer. And I don't think, you know, there's just some pat answer and I wouldn't glibly, you know, just, just try and pass over it. I know those things can be devastating. But don't let it keep you down. Don't quit on God. Don't quit on His goodness. Corey Tin Boom said, we need to believe that God is good even though life sometimes throws you reasons to think that he's not. And that was from a woman that spent many years in a German prison camp. Friend, he is a good God. And then a third reason that many people get knocked down and stay down is just because of physical hardships or opposition from people. The going just gets tough sometimes. And I want you to look back with me in 2 Corinthians, if you would, chapter 11. Here in this chapter, Paul actually begins to give some of his credentials for ministry. 2 Corinthians, the 11th chapter, verse 22. 2 Corinthians 11 and 22. Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they the seed of Abraham? So am I. Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more. In labors more abundant. In stripes above measure. In prisons more frequently. In deaths often. From the Jews five times I received 40 stripes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I've been in the deep. 
in journeys often, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils of my own countrymen, in perils of the Gentiles, in perils in the city, perils in the wilderness, perils in the sea, perils among false brethren. That's a lot of perils. Verse 27, in weariness and toil and sleeplessness often, in hunger and thirst and fastings, and often in cold and nakedness. Besides the other things, what comes upon me daily, my deep concern or my worry for all the churches. He goes on and talks about being led over a wall in a basket to escape assassination. All right, you might have your own list, but I dare say it probably wouldn't compare with that one. <laughs> the Paul never gave up. He never quit. Opposition and foes on every hand. But he kept going. I mean, look at the, the, the stories of people in the Bible. Think of Joseph. He has an encounter with God. And what happens next? The bottom falls out of his life. He has this encounter, this dream from God. His brothers get jealous. They throw him in a pit. Joseph is a teenage kid. He's crying and crying down there, and they don't answer him. Finally, some ropes come down to the pit. He says, okay. Finally, joke's over. He gets out, but it's not his brothers pulling him up. It's some Midianite traders, and his brothers are, you know, taking the cash from the Midianites. They've just sold him into slavery. He can't believe what's happening. He goes off in chains. People are yelling at him, maybe hitting him with a whip. He doesn't even understand the language they're shouting at him. They take him away to Egypt. He's put on the auction block. They're bidding for him. He doesn't know the language. He just knows he's in trouble. Gets sold as a slave. Ends up in Potiphar's house. Potiphar's wife tries to coerce Joseph into sleeping with her. He won't do it until she lies as that Hebrew boy that you brought into the house. He tried to rape me. Potiphar's in a rage, takes Joseph and throws him in prison. And he spends years in prison. Years. Interprets the butler's and the baker's dream. Tells the butler, you're going to be restored to your post with Pharaoh once again. When you are, remember me and get me out of here. Well, you guy says, absolutely. But he absolutely forgot when he got out. And I think from that point, it was, if I'm not mistaken, another two full years that he spent in prison. And you have to be thinking, everything that's happened to Joseph from the time he's had this encounter with God, his life has been turned upside down and shaken out and shaken out and shaken out and shaken out. And he's got to be thinking after years, man, hey, I think I'm going to switch from Jehovah to serve one of those cool looking cat gods in Egypt. <laughs> I mean, look at the Israelites. They're living out in the wilderness in tents, and the Egyptians have these incredible pyramids and temples and wealth, and hey, their gods seem like better than ours, but never. Joseph never quit on God. He never quit serving God. There's not the slightest thread of bitterness anywhere in his story against God. And you know what? The day came that in a moment he was moved from the prison to the palace. He became the prime minister over all of Egypt. And God used Joseph to save everyone in the known world from the coming famine, his own family included. Amazing. Think about David. Saul, you know, is king, but he messes up. And Samuel the prophet comes to Jesse's household, says, hey, show me your sons. God's chosen a new king from among your sons. Has all the boys come by? And God says, no, pass on all of them. Sammy says, is this all the kids you had? He says, well, no, the runt. You know, I didn't even think of calling him. He's out in the field tending the sheep. He's the only one that was working. So David comes, and God says, this is him. So Samuel anoints David to be Israel's next king. What happens? Hey, he gets called to go to Saul's household. He's thinking, that this is happening fast. But instead, Saul picks up a spear and throws it at him. <laughs> David has to run away, and he spends years. Everyone say years. Not days, not weeks, not months, years running from Saul. Saul hunts him down with his troops like some wild animal. David is a vagabond. He's living in caves with a small band of outcasts. And eventually, eventually, he comes to reign over Israel. And when all of the celebration is going and the trumpets are blaring and, and, and people have got their olive branches out and... and you know, the wine is flowing and, and everyone's, you know, feasting. 
David remembered the hard road that he had to walk to get there, even if everyone else didn't remember. You see, you read the stories. We could talk about Abraham. We could talk, talk about Daniel. We could talk about Noah and on and on and on. Every one of them got knocked down. But every one of them got back up and got going again. And maybe you've been knocked down in your life and it seems like, hey, the fight is over. It is not over unless you quit. If you make the decision to get up one more time, I'm telling you, you will win the fight. When Jesus Christ died on the cross, it seemed like the fight was over. That the devil had knocked him out and the precious prize of humanity went to Satan. But after three days, something happened. There was a rumbling in the regions of darkness. The gates of Hades started twisting on their rusty hinges. And there was a little bell that said, ding, final round. Satan said, no, 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 the fight's over. And suddenly resurrection power started flowing into Jesus. And he walked over to a trembling Satan. He took the keys of hell and death and he hit him so hard that it's been 2,000 years and he hasn't recovered yet. And friend, he is not gonna recover. On Friday, when they put Jesus in the grave, it looked bad. On Saturday, it looked even worse. But on Sunday, he was raised from the dead. And it might be Friday for you right now. It might be Saturday for you right now. But I'm telling you, Sunday is coming. The same power that raised Jesus from the dead resides in you, my friend. Knocked down, but I'm not knocked out. I may be perplexed, but I'm not in despair. I may be hemmed in, or so it looks by problems on every side, but God always makes a way of escape. You know, when Jesus died upon the cross, it looked like all was lost, that Satan had the upper hand, that, that Satan was triumphant, that he was victorious and that the cause of God was lost, but just the opposite was true. It was like when Haman made the gallows to hang Mordecai upon. You know, Mordecai was the, the uncle of Queen Esther, but it ended up that Haman was hung upon the very gallows that he made to hang Mordecai on. And what looked like the devil's success and his triumph and his victory turned out to be his ultimate de defeat because Jesus was raised from the dead on the third day. He said, I was dead and I'm alive forevermore and I have the keys of hell and of death. Friend, I want to tell you, Jesus is in charge. Satan has been defeated. And if you open your heart to this risen Savior, your life will never be the same again. Say yes to Jesus. Say yes to his salvation. And do it today, friend. Don't delay. God bless you.